And what we have to do practically, spiritually, is pace ourselves because we're not running a sprint. You know, we're really on a marathon. It's kind of a cross country meet as well, where we're not even sure of what lies before us. You know, and yet in the Word of God, scripture and tradition, and in the writings of the saints and the doctors and mystics of the church, we find this echo that uh, we hear, for example, in Jeremiah 20, 29. I know a lot of people who look to Jeremiah 29 and they cite verse 11 as sort of like their favorite verse. And I can see why. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. But to really appreciate it, verse 11, you got to go back and reread the first 10 verses that lead up to that, because this letter of Jeremiah is a, it's an oracle coming from the prophet, but it's written for those who find themselves in exile, captivity. So they're sojourning in a pagan land in Babylon of all places. You go back to Jeremiah 24 and you realize, well, some were sent into exile, but others weren't. A lot of people survived and stayed behind in Jerusalem after the town after the towns of Judea were conquered. And everybody who was there, comfortable in the capital city of Jerusalem, looked with pity upon the exiles. And yet Jeremiah delivers this oracle. It's a vision of a basket of figs, good figs and bad figs. And he addresses the rulers who are sitting kind of tall and comfortable in Jerusalem and says, you think you're the good figs because you've been spared. In fact, you're rotten to the core. The ones that God loves are the ones that he sent into exile so that through their weakness, through their humiliation, they're going to call upon me. I'm going to hear them. I'm going to provide for them and redeem them. And I'm also going to redeem you, but only because of them. So the hardship of the exiles who have gone before are actually the wellspring of holiness. And so you have the rulers in the political realm, you have the priests and the clergy as well, but they've been delivered a message from Jeremiah that is profoundly upsetting. So back to Jeremiah 29, what we call the Jeremiah option. You see God speaking through his prophet Jeremiah to those who are in captivity, to those who are in total distress, to those on the brink of despair, to those who are fighting anger and depression. And what does he say? I have sent you into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. First of all, build your houses and live in them. Okay, so don't just live in tents. Don't just go from place to place. Second, plant gardens and eat their produce. Get down to daily life. Thirdly, take wives and have sons and daughters. Fourth, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters. In other words, Focus on marriage and recognize the highest priority is family life, your spouse, your children, and your grandchildren. And then you will multiply there and do not decrease. Be open to the life-giving power of marital love and family life. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Seek the shalom of the Babylonian towns and villages where you find yourselves transplanted. And the seventh and final element is this, pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will also find your welfare. It's more than just bloom where you're planted. The seventh element of this series of calls is prayer. Pray together in your family, pray together in the community, and be a light to the nations, beginning with, in a certain sense, the wickedest one of all, which is Babylon. Their ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed Jerusalem later, as well as demolished and desecrated the temple. And so it's like, who are we hearing from? Is this the Lord God through his prophet, or is this just some mixed signal? But over and over again, Jeremiah is speaking to the exile, words of, words of comfort and promise. Now, later on, he gets a little ruffled, and that's why, and that's because you, you, you find that Jeremiah has delivered this initial message and within a few decades, the people of Judah who are exiled in Babylon did what he said. They planted gardens, they built houses, they raised their families, they were having their grandkids, but they're flourishing almost too much. They're prospering. They're sort of not really plugged into the hope 
of a future return. So, you know, what, what bugs Jeremiah even more than the fact that the people of God are in exile and don't know what to do, what bugs them the most is that the people of God are in exile and don't even know it any longer. They're so comfortable, so cozy. And so there are later oracles that he has to deliver. And it sort of reminds us of where we are when we wake up and realize, wow, there is nothing Catholic or Christian about our culture anymore. It's not just post-Christian. It's become an increasingly hostile or anti-Christian. And so we see our kids, we see our grandkids, and it's so easy to accommodate ourselves to the secular culture around us, when in fact, it really is the opposite. We are to, we're to enculturate the gospel. We're to bring it to bear upon our neighbors as well. And in the process, we have to remind ourselves, okay, we're suffering, we're losing, but it's not enough just to figure out policies. Well, how do we lose more slowly? No, how do we win the holiness of God in a hostile land if in fact this whole planet and all of human history is designed to get us home? I'm, I'm reminded of a, an interview I heard on a New York City radio a few years ago. The man was 99 years old. He had been raised in a secular Jewish family. And then later in life, he discovered the Christian faith and then the Catholic church. And at 99, he came into the church. And so this interviewer was asking him to summarize your life experience. After all of this, nearly a century, what is the wisdom that you would share with us? And there was a long pause. And then he said, with an ironic tone, he said, it comes down to this. We're only here to get out of here. And you might say, well, that's only because he was 99 and he knew he was going to be getting out soon. But he was really right for people who are 29 or 39 or 49 or just 19, that all of it, we really have to live life with an eternal perspective. And that doesn't in any way devalue or diminish what we're doing on earth. If anything, it gives it a sort of eternal value. And this is the point, that when we do our daily chores, when we do small deeds, but with sincere faith, hope, and charity, we really end up supernaturalizing what would otherwise be merely natural. And by the time Jeremiah has been done, you know, by the time he's done delivering all of these oracles, you get a sense that perhaps as much or more than any other prophet, he sees that the only logic of God's law and how he enforces it with his people is love, that he's not sending you into exile to get back at you. He's sending us into hardship to get us back to him, to recognize how weak we are, how strong he is, and how much more we need to depend upon him and not upon ourselves so much. And so it, it humbles us so that he can exalt us. I hope that helps.